why is there no bridge between Europe and Africa that connects these two joined continents? Look at this 14 kilometers gap between Europe and Africa. Until today, no country has been able to build a bridge here. This is Mirador del Estraco, a scenic viewpoint of Spain, and that is Mount Jebel Musa, Morocco's most famous mountain, which is clearly visible from Spain, a European country. Because between Spain and Morocco lies the Strait of Gibraltar, so its width is only 14 kilometers. That's about the same distance as from Berlin to Potsdam, or from Paris to Versailles. A short hop by European standards. Without traffic, you could easily cross it in just half an hour. This means that if a bridge or a tunnel is built across the Strait of Gibraltar between the two countries, one could reach Africa from Europe in just half an hour. Just imagine this would not only be a huge strategic advantage for Spain and Morocco, not just for Europe and Africa, but for the whole world. Around 100,000 ships and 18,000 Dow's oil tankers pass through this strait every year. Think about it. To 33% of the world's oil and gas, 50% of world trade, and 80% of the European Union's merchandise trade, that is electronics, raw materials, clothing, automobiles, everything passes through this thin 14 kilometers crack which European, African, and many Asian countries are heavily dependent. But despite this, in the last 100 years, no country has been able to build a bridge connecting Europe and Africa. Why is that? And it's absolutely not that building such a bridge is some impossible task. China has already built a bridge for times bigger than this, the Hong kong shuhai macau Bridge, which was completed in just nine years. Talking about long tunnels, many have been built too. Like the 50 kilometers long channel tunnel, which connects Folkestone Town in the UK to Cocaise in France. It was built in 1990, the longest tunnel in the world. Yet it was completed in just six years. But the project to build a link between Spain and Morocco has been ongoing for the last 100 years. In fact, companies like LBD and Herent Neck have even received contracts for it, companies that have pulled off miracles in impossible terrains like the Swiss Alps, the world's longest train tunnel. 57 kilometers long under the Swiss Alps cost 11 billion euros to build. The Goddard Base Train Tunnel had been a dream of the Swiss people for over a century. But here, all the world's brilliant minds come to a stop. Every idea fails. Every engineering plan either remains only on paper or sinks into the depths of the sea. So the question arises, what hidden secret lies in the Strait of Gibraltar that again and again defeats human courage? Let's find out. In 1920, a German architect named Hermann Skurgel proposed a daring plan, a plan to drain the entire Mediterranean Sea and create a new continent called Atlantropa. His idea was simple. If a hydroelectric dam was built across the Strait of Gibraltar, the water level of the Mediterranean could be reduced by about 660 feet. From that, submerged coastal land could be reclaimed to form a new landmass called Atlantropa, physically connecting Africa and Europe. Plus, this hydroelectric dam would also generate energy for both continents. Herman named this plan project Atlantropa, and it was a very well thought out plan. He even considered that to build such a dam at the Strait of Gibraltar, he would also have to build at least seven more dams around the region, like the Dardanelles Dam on the Turkey-Greece border to control the level of the Black Sea. Then, a dam between Sicily and Tunisia to manage the interior water flow of the Mediterranean, etc., etc., but there was one problem. If the Mediterranean's water level was lowered for land reclamation, then the Red Sea's water level would remain high. So how would ships cross? Well, Herman had a solution for this too. He proposed using lock chambers. He suggested that the Suez Canal between the two seas could be expanded and equipped with lock chambers, so that ships could sail between two different water levels. According to Herman's plan, a series of lock chambers would be built between the Red Sea and the drained Mediterranean, 
When a ship entered, the chamber door would close, then water would be filled or drained depending on the level, and then the chamber would open, allowing the ship to easily pass from the high-level Red Sea to the low-level Mediterranean. The same system is successfully used today in the Panama Canal. For this, in 1980, two public companies were created, Spain's Sechegsa and Morocco's SNED. Together, these two companies began detailed investigations into the Strait of Gibraltar. Surveys were launched, one of the most prominent being the 1991 Sea of Nautilus Survey. In this, the ship Nautilus was to drill 5 meters deep into the strait's bedrock and bring samples up to the surface for scientists to study. But Nautilus failed its mission. So the next year, another ship, Paulus, was sent. But even then, the drill rod broke, the ship began vibrating, and the mission had to be aborted. During this period, many such missions were attempted between Spain and Morocco. But some ships couldn't anchor, some couldn't detect the ocean. Floor depth. The main reason? The strait's location. It is a choke point. On the right side lies the Mediterranean Sea near the equator, hence warm water. On the left side, the Atlantic Ocean bringing cold meltwater from the Arctic. Plus, there. Densities differ. The strait is one of the few places where these two waters collide. When they meet, the warm, lighter water rises, the cold, heavier water sinks. This difference creates strong convection currents, scientifically called upwelling. The water swirls so fast, it's as if the entire strait is filled with countless whirlpools. Surface currents have speeds of at least 11 km per hour. Add wind speeds of 108 km per hour. And you can imagine how hard it is for a ship to stay anchored in one place for a survey. And that's why no ship could stay stable long enough for research. But finally, by 1997, after numerous trials, researchers finalized two possible routes for a bridge. The first was the canyon route between Punter Sires and Punter Canals, only 14 kilometers, the shortest. The second was the threshold route further west, between Puntar Paloma and Puntar Malabada, 228 kilometers, while research continued. Far away in America, an engineer named Eugene Sui was watching every detail. Sui was no ordinary man, a rebel architect. When the world was building bridges with conventional steel and concrete, Sui, inspired by nature, introduced the floating bridge concept. A bridge on the canyon route that would float instead of standing on pillars. No boring steel pillars. No traditional beams. Sui's design looked like a giant sea serpent. Starting from Tarifa, Spain, it would gradually submerge under the sea so ships could pass above. For two miles, it would stay underwater like a tunnel, then re-emerge at a floating, artificial island in the middle of the sea. Yes, under this plan, a three-mile-wide man-made floating city would rise in the strait, with 24-lane roadways, multiple rail lines, windmills, a 23-story building, gardens, theaters, markets, waterfalls, swimming pools, solar farms, everything. To withstand the sea, it was to be built with waterproof, electrolytic concrete, stainless steel, anodized aluminum futuristic materials of that time. The bridge design was fish-like, with one main spine like a backbone ensuring strength. Pre-made blocks, loosely connected, would sway and absorb shocks instead of breaking. Anchored by triple cables at both ends, the bridge would be flexible. Sui dreamed this would become the eighth wonder of the world. But two huge problems came. First, finance the estimated cost was $10 billion, around 85,000 crore. Second, Sechegza and Sned surveys revealed harsh truths about the seabed. On the canyon, route 14 kilometers, the depth is 800 meters, three Eiffel Towers stacked. Compare, the Channel Tunnel's deepest point is only 180 meters. Building pillars here would need three Eiffel Tower high supports, many of them costing billions. As for a tunnel, Digging 900 meters under sea level is nearly impossible. 
For comparison, the deepest undersea road tunnel today, Norway's Rifhilk Tunnel, is only 292 meters, below sea level, a third as deep. Another issue, the seabed is filled with breccia and clay, weak porous material, like wet soil mixed with stones. Building on it risks collapse. Unlike the channel tunnel, where the seabed is chalk marl, strong enough for support. Below the clay lies hard rock, making excavation extremely difficult. Worst of all, right beneath the strait lies the fault line of the African and Eurasian tectonic plates, an active seismic zone. The infamous Lisbon earthquake struck here, killing 60,000. Tremors still occur. Building a bridge with pillars on. Two shifting plates, disaster. Even tunnels here would cross a fault line, the world's greatest engineering challenge. Also, the strait is one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. Tankers, container ships, aircraft carriers regularly pass. Any bridge would need 70 meters clearance above water. It's combined with 900 meters depth, construction nearly impossible. So in the early 2000s, Spain and Morocco's Joint Committee decided to abandon the canyon route and focus on the threshold route 28 kilometers, where depth is only 300 meters, clay layers only 400 meters, and fewer hard rocks. Three major problems of the canyon route solved. The plan. Not a bridge, but three parallel tunnels. The central one for service, the other two for rail. Travel time between Casablanca and Madrid would reduce from 12 hours to 5.5 hours. Trade would boom. In 2006, both governments invited tenders. Swiss company LBD Engineering won the contract. Spain's ministers even said construction would start by 2008. But then came politics. In 2008, Spain's king visited Ceuta and Melilla territories inside Morocco's borders, but controlled by Spain since colonial times. Morocco was furious, recalled its ambassador, and froze the project. In 2020, Spain allowed medical treatment for a Western Sahara rebel leader, again angering Morocco, as Spain seemed to support rebellion. The project stalled again. So from 2008 to 2025, diplomatic clashes have kept the link on hold. Meanwhile, the U.S., U.K., China, India, and the E.U. pressure both countries because the Strait of Gibraltar is too strategic. 33% of the world's oil and gas, 50% of trade, 80% of E.U. merchandise pass through. If blocked, global economies collapse. An alternate link is urgent. But before a bridge of steel and concrete, Spain and Morocco need a bridge of trust and understanding. A bridge not built by engineers' hands, but by the hearts of nations. The future of this project, only time will tell. Divide in parts. But before a bridge of steel and concrete can rise, Spain and Morocco must first build another kind of bridge. A bridge of trust and understanding. A bridge not constructed by the hands of engineers, but by the hearts of nations. A foundation. Laid not in rock or clay but in respect, cooperation, and shared vision. A bridge not constructed by the hands of engineers, but by the hearts of nations. A foundation laid not in rock or clay, but in respect, cooperation, and shared vision. Because the Strait of Gibraltar is more than just a 14-kilometer stretch of water. It is the meeting point of continents, cultures, economies, and histories. It is a gateway where the destinies of Europe and Africa converge. If Spain and Morocco succeed, they won't just link to countries. They could reshape global trade, geopolitics, and human connection. Engineering challenges can be overcome. Technology will advance. Money can be raised. But without political, will, without trust, without the courage to reconcile, even the strongest materials will crumble. And so, the future of this project will not be written only in construction contracts or feasibility studies. It will be written in diplomacy, in peace, in the determination of nations to rise above rivalry and think as partners. Perhaps one day, 
Travelers will board a train in Madrid and step out hours later in Casablanca, barely believing they had crossed from Europe to Africa under the sea. Perhaps one day, the dream will no longer be a dream. But until then, the greatest bridge yet to be built is the one that unites two peoples. The future of the Gibraltar crossing, only time will tell. The dream of a bridge between continents may still be unfinished, but your support builds a bridge to more stories like this. Like, share, and subscribe, and join us on the next journey.